The Brothers' War, also known as the Antiquities' War, is one of the oldest story arcs in Magic the Gathering lore. Way back in the year 1994, around the time when Black Lotus was worth the same as a Shivan Dragon, Wizards of the Coast released a set called Antiquities, which visualized, in living color, the epic conflict between Urza and Mishra. Now, I'm no Ristic Studies, but in those days, the art on the cards was heavily inspired by 90s card art. For instance, if you take a close look at this picture, then you can tell from the color balance, movement, emphasis, and negative space that this haircut is banging. I've never felt that the art from Antiquities does justice to the story of Urza and Mishra, which is why I'm glad that Wizards decided to revisit the Brothers' War in the set called The Brothers' War. Now this is what I imagined when I first read Jeff Grubbs' novel, not to mention that Urza and Mishra also got a serious glow up. But who are these people anyway, and why are they fighting? And what does a cup have to do with any of this? Here we have the continent of Teresier, and over here is the nation of Argive, where Urza and Mishra are born. And though they come from minor nobility, they don't get to enjoy their privilege for long. When they're both teenagers, their scheming stepmom has them shipped out into the desert so she can steal their inheritance. But the two bros end up liking the desert because an old archaeologist named Takasia lets them dig for ancient artifacts belonging to an extinct civilization called the Thran, who had nice things. One day, Takasia and the two bros find a cave full of dead Thran robots, and inside the cave there's a shiny rock. Mishra says, I want that rock, but Urza says, no, don't break it, you dummy. When they both grab the rock, it explodes, knocking everyone out and filling their head with dreams. Dreams of a world made of living metal over a tissue-based endoskeleton. When everyone comes around, the brothers fight over whose fault it is, but Takasia says, hey kids, all those robots are coming back to life. We should probably run. Insert chase scene, where we discover that Mishra's half of the stone makes all the pursuing robots slow and weak, while Urza's stone makes them much stronger and faster. Although they all make it back to camp intact, each brother wants the other's half of the rock. One night, Mishra sneaks into Urza's room while he's sleeping and tries to steal the Might Stone. But Urza wakes up and the two bros use their rocks to have a battle of energy beams. Takasia shows up and says, Stop! Beam battles can result in explosions. But they don't listen, so she steps into the beams and dies in an explosion. Urza is upset, while Mishra pulls a disappearing act and runs away into the desert. It's the last time the brothers will see each other for many years. Years later, over here in the nation of Yosha, the retired warrior king has a daughter that he needs to marry off to someone. And the aristocracy is full of dandies that he doesn't approve of. So he holds a strength competition. Any manly man that can carry a big statue across a courtyard gets to win the princess's hand in marriage. A bunch of big dudes sprain their groins trying to lift the statue, but Urza sees a loophole in the rules and builds a big robot, which lifts the statue for him and wins the competition. So he gets to marry the princess, whom he promptly ignores. See, he was never interested in her to begin with. What he really wanted was a rare book that was part of her dowry and her money. With said money, he builds a big workshop and hires laborers and assistants. And with the rare book, which contains Thran blueprints, he begins building stuff. Artifacts. The princess, Caleb Ben Krug, is not too pleased with her new husband. Mishra, meanwhile, is still in the desert, busy being a stooge for the phalagi. Phalagi? The phal... phal... Falaji, a group of ned uh, they're, they're desert nomads. One night, a dragon made of living metal attacks the nomad camp and kills a bunch of people. But Mishra tames the beast with his weak stone. All the Falaji are super impressed and they promote him from slave to wizard. It's quite a promotion. With Mishra's dragon engine, his group of desert nomads manages to conquer all the other desert nomads, making one big Falaji empire. This makes the coastal nations kind of nervous, so they call a peace conference. Over here in the town called Korlinda, Urza and Mishra get to reunite for the first time in years. Urza represents Yosha, while Mishra represents the Falaji. But before the two bros can catch up, the peace conference falls to pieces and everyone starts attacking each other. I had nothing to do with this, says Urza, while Mishra says we should probably, you know, get back to our sides. And it gets awkward. Battle can result in social discomfort. The Falaji run away into the desert, but during the fight, the king of Yosha, Urza's father-in-law, becomes dead, which makes Caleb and Krug the new queen of Yosha, but Urza still ignores her. Do you know who doesn't ignore her? Mishra. The Falaji Empire give Mishra permission to negotiate on their behalf, so once the heat from that failed peace conference dies down, Mishra sends Queen Kayla a letter saying, you know, that whole Corlinda thing was a mess. Really sorry what happened. How about we meet up and talk it out for real this time? Settle some territory disputes? And maybe Urza and I can catch up brother to brother. Kayla accepts, and Mishra heads down to Krug, the capital of Yosha, being all charming and diplomatic 
diplomatic. The two brothers shake hands and smile and pretend that everything's all right. But secretly, Mishra makes a deal with Kayla. The kingdom of Yosha abuts the Falaji Empire, and there's contested land between the two. Mishra is willing to cede all disputed territories to Yosha in exchange for one thing, Urza's Mightstone. After all this time, he still wants that rock. Either Mishra is really charming, or Kayla's marriage with Urza is not going well, because after a party where Urza gets drunk and passes out, Queen Kayla steals the Mightstone off of his neck while he's sleeping, and not only gives it to Mishra, but decides to stick around in the guest bedroom, where the two of them proliferate. But Urza wakes up and barges in on the growth spiral, and he snatches back his might stone. Just like all those years ago, the two bros have another epic beam battle. Urza gets distracted by a fly, and Mishra knocks him out with his green beam. Then Mishra pulls a disappearing act and runs away before the palace guards can capture him. When Urza regains consciousness for the second time in the past hour, he scrambles all his ornithopter squadrons to scour the land and hunt down his brother. And Urza is out there flying alongside his pilots, which conveniently allows him to avoid having to talk with the queen about their relationship issues. Mishra and the Falaji fade into the desert, but at night Mishra keeps dreaming of that machine world made of living metal. Following his dreams, he decides to go back to that same cave where he and Urza first found that shiny rock. His apprentice, Ashnod, tags along, and she accidentally trips over a magical button, which opens a portal to Phyrexia. Hey, this is the world I keep dreaming about, says Mishra, all excited. In Phyrexia, Mishra and Ashnod find a bunch of dragon engines, and just like with the first one, Mishra tames all of them with his weak stone. But unfortunately, they already belong to someone, a demon named Gix, who isn't all that thrilled that someone is taking his stuff. Insert chase scene where Mishra and Ashnod flee back to the portal with their stolen goods. Gix can't catch them in time before the portal closes. Do you know what's better than one dragon engine? How about five? The desert nomads lay a trap, which shoots down Urza's ornithopter while he's still out there hunting his brother. With Urza out of the way, the Falaji invade Yosha, with Mishra's new dragon engines leading the charge. As Queen Kayla bin Crew watches her city burn to the ground, she reflects on the choices that she's made. During the attack, Ashnod pulls a sneaky Game of Thrones type move and kills the leader of the Falaji, the Kadir. After they win the battle, guess who the Falaji pick as their next leader? Mishra. With the newly annexed kingdom of Yosha, Mishra is the ruler of a huge chunk of land. But things immediately start going south for him. He feels that Ashnod has too much power and influence in his court, so he exiled the very person that got him to where he is. And with Urza out of the picture, either dead or in hiding somewhere, Mishra turns his attention west and starts conquering in that direction. Over here in Teresia City, a bunch of liberal arts hippies keep talking about the third path, which involves tapping into the memory of the land to perform feats of dare I say, magic? The very existence of hippies offends Mishra, so he burns their city to the ground. But some of the hippies escape, and they bring some nice things along with them, including a fancy cup. Ashnod shows up and says, hey, that's a nice cup you got there, hand it over. But the hippies tell her, okay, but be careful, this cup gives off really bad vibes. Whatever you do, don't fill it with memories of the land. Right, whatever, says Ashnod, taking all of their stuff. Meanwhile, back on the east coast, the nations of Argive and Corliss are freaking out. How do we stop Mishra's killer robots, says Argive. I don't know, says Korlos. Why don't we ask the other killer robot expert? So they pay Urza a bunch of money to come out of hiding and build a bunch of robots to fight against his brother's robots. But all this warring requires a lot of resources, and Teresia is getting tapped out. Luckily, Urza's people find a nice island full of nature to exploit. Some elves already live there, but I'm sure they won't mind a bit of industrial development. Gix, the Phyrexian demon, hears about this fresh new island. How does he hear about it? Through his cult that he's been cultivating. Ah uh ha -huh, ha, uh ha -huh. ha, kill me. Though Gix hasn't forgotten that Mishra stole his stuff, the Phyrexian is chilling for now. He's come to Dominaria, but he hasn't revealed himself just yet. While everyone is busy killing each other, he's been building a cult who worship the machine gods of Phyrexia and like to cut off their own limbs and replace them with metal parts. Though he sent his priests all over the land to spread the gospel, most people think the extreme body modders are weird, but they still allow them to hang around. But do you know who doesn't think they're weird? Do you know who embraces them wholeheartedly? Mishra. It's always Mishra. See, Mishra's been getting a bit paranoid about his brother. He's heard about Urza's new gig as the Lord Protector of Corliss and Argive, and... 
Mishra starts getting sick. He's gained a bit of weight. He hasn't been sleeping. He's starting to feel ill. But then these priests come along and tell him that the flesh is inherently weak. Only through mechanical enhancement can you become better, more perfect, more complete. The priests also tell Mishra about Urza's new island, and Mishra thinks out loud, you know, I want to exploit nature too. So he sends his whole army down there for the final showdown, and Gix comes along too. And so does Ashnod, and she brings with her the cup of bad vibes from the hippies. Originally, she was planning on giving the cup to Mishra in hopes of winning back his good graces, but when she meets her old boss, he looks a bit different, and Mishra doesn't give her as warm a welcome as she expected. Specifically, he, he kicks her out again. So Ashnod decides to go find someone who will appreciate her and her fancy cup. But before she can make it to Urza's side of the island, war happens. The armies of killer robots that both Urza and Mishra have been building over the years finally meet in the middle of Argoth. Then Gix makes an appearance on the battlefield and makes everyone start punching themselves. Ashnot finally gets the cup to Urza and she passes along the advice that she learned from the hippies. Fill the cup with memories of the land, she says. Or wait, was it don't fill the cup? Did they say fill the cup or don't fill the cup? Oh no, it's Gix! While Ashnod is busy dying to the demon, Urza ponders over the cup. Before he can make a decision, Mishra shows up in person, emerging from the fog like a final boss, and he has a dragon engine with him. Except he's like fused together with his dragon engine or something, they're like melded. With his back against the wall, Urza has no choice but to trust in the hippies, and he unloads himself into the cup, filling it with memories of the land. The blast from the Golgothian Silex wipes out the armies, and the whole continent drowns. Even the demon Gix is forced to teleport back to Phyrexia. But Mishra catches the blast full in the face, so he's gone. But his weak stone remains. So Urza finally gets to finish his rock collection, and he promptly shoves them into his eyeballs and becomes a planeswalker. With his newfound powers, Urza decides to leave Dominaria because this place is a dump, and someone else can clean up the mess. 